Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming this uh, today. Uh, this is the fourth in a series of lectures which the LSE Ideas uh, has been holding on looking at how we strategize particular problems. We've looked at uh, security policy from an American and Russian point of view before Ukraine, I hasten to add. We've covered subjects such as urban planning, urbanization in Africa, uh, and how middle powers like Singapore deal with very large powers like China. And today we're moving to climate change. I mentioned Ukraine because I saw in an in opinion poll uh, last week that only 6% of Americans think that Ukraine is one of the top three challenges that they are going to face in the future. Climate change, you'll be delighted to know, despite the number of climate change uh, deniers or others, uh, in the United States, they think is one of the three. But of course, Ukraine and, and climate change are not uh, unconnected. And there are distinct environmental and other problems, which, in fact, our speaker will discuss and uh, mention tonight. So can I just introduce uh, our two speakers, Robert Faulkner, a uh, former colleague of mine in the International Relations Department, professor, uh, academic director of TRIUM, which is a global executive MBA program, a uh, distinguished uh, fellow of the Munch uh, School, Global Affairs at the University of Toronto, uh, recently director, a research director of the Grantham Institute. In fact, he only stood down for that after five years last month. And can I also introduce a discussant to Robert's talk, uh, Rita Floyd, who is uh, at Birmingham, uh, has been a British Academy uh, fellow, uh, and is now a Birmingham Fellow in Conflict and Security. Now, how this will run is that Robert will speak first, uh, then I will invite Rita to act as a discussant, uh, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. And we're also online as well, so there may be some people who will be asking questions there as well. Uh, can I just encourage you to put your phones on silent, just in case it interferes with the technology, um, and there will be Hopefully, we're told we can't promise because there are always technical glitches, but we hope to have a, a podcast. So without further ado, Robert, I can invite you to come up. Well, thank you very much, Christopher, for, for the very kind introduction. And thank you, Rita, for being here coming down to London uh, for the discussion role and for engaging in the discussion. I'm very much looking forward to that. Thank you all for being here. Great pleasure to talk about climate change, Ukraine, strategy, and security. Um, when Professor, Professor Coker introduced last year, I think it was, this lecture series on strategy, new voices, he mentioned the need to rethink strategy because people had got it wrong, I think you said. And we need strategy more than ever, but we also need to do it right. And I want to take this as my starting point for tonight's lecture, because I think I agree with you uh, on so many fronts. There are at least two major shortcomings of strategic thinking. Uh, the first set of shortcomings or failures, if you wish, uh, are those that are familiar to anyone who follows the news of what's happening in Ukraine. Europe, the West, was ill-prepared for the aggression that Russia unleashed on Ukraine on 24th February this year. We didn't quite see it coming. We didn't quite believe it would be possible. Uh, we also went into the crisis with a set of blinkers that were a strategic mi miscalculation, including, as I shall discuss later on, our reliance on Russian energy imports. There are other such shortcomings on the more traditional security agenda. If you look at our position regarding Taiwan and how we approached China's engagement in the global community. Again, there may be a major miscalculation uh, that we detect here in terms of our assumptions about how China would change as we would integrate it into the global economy. And you can add to that what happened in Afghanistan, in Syria, and so on. But that's not the strategic failures I want to focus on. I want to talk about a different type of strategic shortcoming, one that it's more about the blind spots of strategic thinking. And that concerns broader concerns around global policy and global governance, failures to deal with different types of threats. And here tonight, I will focus on the environmental threat and climate change in particular, which I argue has not been taken seriously enough in traditional strategic 
thinking. And so my argument will be, let me make the argument up front in good old LSE tradition, so anyone who doesn't like what I'm going to say can walk out now. There's a pub next door. Um, I think we need to, first of all, conceive of climate change as a global security threat, and that threat is becoming increasingly urgent. Secondly, we therefore also need a stronger strategic focus on how to deal with climate change. The community that deals with climate policy issues isn't always fully aware of the kind of strategic dilemmas that we face in dealing with that threat. And thirdly, we need to increasingly recognize that our collective response to climate change therefore intersects with energy security and geopolitics in ways that we haven't quite understood yet. So I think there's a message here for those of you who are in strategic studies to take climate change more, serious, more seriously and more urgently, and those in climate debates to take strategic studies more seriously. All right, let me get started. And this is the point where I think I need help. Thank you. All right, so the topic of my talk, the strategic nexus between climate change, energy, and geopolitics. What I want to talk about is basically four things. I'm going to start out with outlining what I think are the environmental blind spots in, in strategic thinking. I'll then talk a little bit about why climate change is a security threat and in what ways our thinking has to evolve when we address it in those terms. I'll then touch on Russia's invasion of Ukraine and show how the three topics, energy security and climate, are interconnected. And I'll then conclude with an agenda for the study of uh, geopolitics and strategic uh, studies that will integrate climate and energy into this area. So let's start with the introductory remarks about where the environmental blind spots are in strategic thinking. I think this is hopefully an agreeable summary of where strategic thinking has been in the past. I think it's fair to say its focus has traditionally been state-centric. It's focused on national sovereignty and security. It's particularly concerned with the use of force for other purposes, uh, particularly also in, in the context of uh, structures of war and peace. It's concerned with how the use of force feeds into or undermines the search for international order. And this is where, of course, we're interested in understanding how great powers shape both global order projects, but also how they use force in order to either maintain or change those international orders. Uh, the, the, the boundaries of strategic thinking are often ill-defined. For some scholars in this field, strategy is essentially about grand strategy, and uh, very few countries can afford to have a grand strategy. That's largely the United States and China these days. For others, um, the European Union, no doubt, has its own strategy. Uh, for others, other powers matter here too. But there comes a point where I think strategy is less relevant. Smaller states, isolated states, don't need really much of a strategy. They tend to adapt. They find their niche and hope to get on in life, in international life. So strategic thinking is usually reserved for some of the greater powers, indeed the superpowers. Uh, more recently, however, non-state actors have emerged in strategic thinking, particularly with the rise of violent non-state groups, think of terrorist groups, that feature much more prominently here. That's a traditional way of framing strategic thinking. My argument is that we need to broaden this perspective quite significantly. And the way to get into this is simply to accept, if, if you want to follow me down this path, that we now live in what scientists call the Anthropocene. The idea being that we have amassed so much industrial and military power that human society leaves more traces in the geolo geological memory of the planet today than any other force that has shaped our geology in the past. We live in a world where human impact is the main force that shapes the future health and nature of the planet. This means there are new environmental threats arising to national sovereignty and security. Low-lying island, uh, low island states may soon be uh, disappearing from this planet as sea levels rise. Uh, there are other forms in which 
states and the well-being of the societies they protect are affected by these environmental threats. Just imagine what it would look like to think about the balance of power in a world that's two or three degrees warmer, with violent storms raging, with sea levels having risen. Can we think about international order in traditional terms when we face a radically different planet that's changed by global warming? Do we know which will be the great powers of the future? Who will be the environmental powers of the future that control both the natural resources we need to survive in a three degrees warmer world, but also that have impact and influence over the search for solutions that can control the global climate? What will be their relations be like? What will great power balance in this kind of environment, radically environmentally changed world uh, uh, look like? This leads, therefore, to a kind of geopolitics of the environment, where natural resources play a different role, no longer just as input factors into military strategy, but also as key ingredients in terms of a global balancing strategy for uh, the ever-changing uh, planet. And this, therefore, leads to a much broader range of actors and agency uh, in global politics. We need to look beyond the traditional great powers to understand who has the power to change both the politics but also the responses to climate change and environmental disasters. So there's a diffusion of political agency happening too. And that makes it much more difficult, of course, to apply the established categories of strategic thinking. Now, what does this mean when we focus now on climate change as the main threat that we are addressing in today's talk? The traditional way to think about climate change is to look at, as you can see here on this graph, as a fairly linear problem that has arisen because we have pumped ever more CO2 into the atmosphere. And as you can see from, from the uh, 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 graph here, the, the emissions have risen more or less since the beginning of the Industrial Age. They've uh, risen much faster since the end of the Second World War when the post-war growth of the global economy really kick-started and led to a much, much wider range of industrializing projects that led to ever more emissions. The, the rise in emissions has been fairly linear. There are a few bumps along the way. As you can see here, the oil crisis in the 70s reduced emissions temporarily. Uh, the global financial crisis did its own good on that front. So thanks to the City of London and Wall Street for just helping to pause global emissions uh, temporarily. The COVID-19 pandemic also led to a temporary halt. But so far, the story is a depressing one because we've picked up that path ever since. But because of that seeming linearity in the, the way in which the crisis has crept up on us, we've ended up thinking about climate change in similar linear terms. That means we've decided to treat it through normal politics, often quite boring politics. Uh, how do you improve energy efficiency? How do you insulate your home? How do you increase solar energy uh, in the energy mix? Those are gradual improvements that we've tried to make in our industrial systems, in the way in which society is organized. And so climate politics is usually framed as part of so-called low politics or normal politics. That has, to some extent, lulled us into thinking that if only we apply normal political approaches, more of the same, a bit of international cooperation, a bit of uh, investment by the private sector, by the state in renewable energy, we can eventually solve this problem. And because the environmental impacts, particularly those that are long-term, are uncertain, states have preferred to push the agenda out into the future. It is rational for states to ignore long-term threats when they're faced with short-term costs and risks. And for that reason, much of what happened in the UNFCCC negotiations is an entirely a rational game by states. Avoid hard decisions, see how it all works out, and for some states, think Canada, Russia, global warming may even be a positive gain story. Um, uh, Russia certainly can drill for oil in ever uh, more northern areas. So there is, there is, therefore, a problem with the way in which we framed this, and I'd like to challenge that. Look at this from a different angle. Look at the way in which 
the crisis that climate change is going to bring has arrived long before we thought, 10, 15 years ago, we thought this would be a problem for our children, for my children, for your children and next generations. Look at how this has changed. Let me give you just a few examples. If we look at the flooding crisis that has afflicted Pakistan just recently, uh, the, the rains that usually start in, uh, I think, in June and then carry on through the summer till August, this year alone were three times as high as they used to be. That has led to a situation where a third of the country ended up under water. The estimated damage to the country so far, we are not over the worst of the crisis yet, has been 30 billion, that's a, perhaps a conservative estimate. A good th 33 million people have been affected by the crisis. 1,700 deaths have been recorded so far. Um, two million homes are damaged or lost. And 45% of the cotton crop of a country that depends on its cotton exports has been destroyed. If that was caused by the military aggression of a neighboring country in one um, relatively short-term military campaign, we would describe that as an imminent security threat and one that would trigger security response. But because it has been a climate-enhanced environmental catastrophe, of course, it's not framed in that way. But it's important to note, this is not just a regular occurrence of flooding that is, of course, common in, in countries that live in that region. It's estimated that the intensity of the rainfall in Pakistan has been increased by at least 50% because of global uh, warming. And that means those kind of extreme crises will become more frequent. The same can be said about wildfires. Um, anyone who's spent the summer in the south of uh, Europe, ar around the Mediterranean, or in California, or in Australia, will have witnessed the ferocity with which wildfires have spread. Um, we've uh, seen uh, uh, an increase in the fire, uh, fires that have raged uh, through various countries across the globe. It's not just an isolated phenomenon. Mexico has had its normal share of wildfires by April this year, and the fires have continued this year. The droughts that Europe has experienced were described as the worst in 500 years. 500 years. The problem is we are now experiencing one in a hundred or one in 500 year droughts and fire seasons every few years. These are no longer the exceptional uh, crisis that we face. These are now the new normal. If we look at heat waves, has anyone spent the summer here in July in London? Some of you will have arrived only uh, in September. You would have experienced 40 degrees and more in some parts of the UK. Now, for some of you, that may have been a welcome change to the usual weather in London, but that is not the way many people in, in the UK would have seen it. It was an extremely rare event. It said that even if you take into account global warming as a force that's driving the rise in temperature, that has meant that we experienced temperatures that were a once in a, in a century uh, uh, episode. And that's happening more frequently. Now, 40 degrees is, un, is unpleasant, but not unbearable. But we increasingly see uh, uh, heat waves of up to 50 and over 50 degrees. This summer alone, both in Pakistan and in India, we've had a prolonged period where temperatures in Sindh province in central India reached over 50 degrees. 50 degrees over several days means that life as normal cannot continue. Factories close down, agriculture has to stop, People, people's lives are at threat. And that's now a regular occurrence in many uh, parts of the world. And that's increasingly driven by climate change. And storms have, of course, increased. We've always had hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, but the intensity and the frequency, again, is on the rise, and every bit of warming is driving up the pressure there. Uh, it's not just lives that are disrupted, it's life people's savings that are disrupted. Uh, infrastructure in Florida has been destroyed on a massive scale, and many people live in houses that are their pension savings. So we're facing also a much longer crisis in terms of which assets we are going to protect against these intensified environmental catastrophes and which ones we will have to let go. And that creates not just uh, environmental problems, that creates huge social and, and uh, political problems. So 
The key lesson is, therefore, the key takeaway is that these are not isolated incidents that will go away. They're intensifying and they're speeding up. And every degree of warming that we add to this increases the damage that climate change produces. Which brings me to a different framing of the climate risks that we are facing. So instead of thinking of it as a linear problem that we're dealing with through normal means, we have to accept that it is fundamentally characterized by non-linearity and so-called tipping points. There are a couple of tipping points that will be familiar. Uh, as the ice caps of Antarctica and Greenland melt, sea levels will rise. And the, the, the melting of ice accelerates the warming process. Less solar radiation is, is sent back into space. The breakdown of the Gulf Stream, which is starting to slow, is likely to lead to uh, un, uh, un, pretty uncomfortable climatic conditions in Europe. The Gulf Stream is already slowing, and it's foreseeable that should we reach a tipping point where it simply stops, uh, the entire basis for agriculture and livelihoods in Europe will change. Uh, sea levels uh, have been rising at about 1.4 millimeter a year in the 20th century, year on year. They're now ra uh, rising at levels of 3.6 millimeters every year. So again, this is a non-linear change that is accelerating. Once the Amazonian rainforest is gone, then the entire ecosystem of South America, weather patterns, rain patterns, will be changed forever. And so we're facing a situation where if these tipping points kick in, if we reach them and can't prevent global warming from reaching these tipping points, global warming itself accelerates. The current predictions are two to three degrees, but some scientists say we may well end up with four degrees, five degrees, or six degrees, which takes us well outside any historic proportion of what we've experienced before. And just to illustrate the non-linearity that we face, here's an interesting um, illustration that, um, that was presented at a recent workshop. Oops, it's meant to work like this. Oh, it's not working. Okay. I don't think we can fix this. It's meant to be animated, but um, do you think there's anything we can do? No. Sorry. <laughs> you don't mind if I blame you for that, uh, for that slightly? No, no, just sure. Sorry about that. It worked when I tried it out earlier on, uh, so believe me. Um, just trust me. So, so what, what I was going to show you is this illustration, which shows you that, that circle, a ball in a well, and it sits on the left, and the ball previously sits in a, a higher level of the well, and as the well deepens to this side, eventually the ball finds its new equilibrium to the right. And on the right-hand side, you see depicted the non-linear change in, in the energy balance here. And that's a very simple depiction of a seemingly linear change, the ever, ever so slow lowering of the well on the right-hand side that leads to a non-linear effect in environmental terms. And once the ball has fallen to the right, it has reached a lower level in the well. It can no longer be pushed back up. It has reached a new equilibrium, and that's what's so dangerous. You can't go back behind the tipping point that you've reached. Okay, that's the ecological dimension. But there are important social, political, and economic tipping points we need to consider. This is what gets me then into the argument about security. Because if climate change has these kind of effects where it creates an imbalance that leads to sudden and unexpected adjustments, then we should expect rapid changes in the social, political, and economic context. So, for example, ecological disasters that undermine livelihoods could easily lead to very sudden and dramatic migration flows. Some scholars argue that we already see some effect of that. I wouldn't go as far as saying that global migration is currently driven predominantly by climate change but it's relatively easy to work out why an increase in ecological stresses could increase the numbers of people moving. We will, we will likely see greater resource competition in local contexts. Right? Rivers 
lakes disappearing. Will, this will undermine agriculture. This will lead to conflict within states over those resources. That will have to be managed. That can again reach certain tipping points. We will find that some states will collapse under the burden of the distributional conflicts this creates. This is not a scenario of, of all political systems breaking up, though if you look around northern hemispheres, the politics are pretty fragile in many countries. But this is as yet uh, mostly uh, concentrated on, on developing countries. But the fear of state collapse because of ecological stress stresses can no longer be ruled out. And interesting enough, we should also reflect on the fact that the policy measures we take to deal with climate change, say phasing out CO2 emissions, reducing our reliance on fossil fuels, could itself trigger political economic consequences. Think of the dangers of stranded assets. What will happen to those countries, those companies that possess fossil fuel assets that will no longer be allowed to be used? What happens for example, to financial stability. There's a good reason why central banks around the world, from the Bank of England to the European Central Bank to the Bank of China, are looking at climate change as a potential disruptor of financial instability and are asking, therefore, for greater transparency in the financial system. So there are good reasons to think of climate change not so much as a source of conflict, a direct drive of conflict, but as a threat multiplier. Conflict will still be driven by other forces. It's state failure that drives people abroad. It's the failure of states to, for example, deal with distributive conflicts that leads to intrastate conflict. But climate change, change, change becomes that multiplier that accelerates and exacerbates those conflicts. And for that reason, we need to prepare for those tipping points that will drive us into ever greater climate insecurity. Now, you might think that the realization of that should have already allowed us to come up with securitized responses. I'm not quite sure if someone is sending me a message here, but, um, <laughs> but the computer is certainly unhappy. Securitization has been on the agenda for some time. Uh, military organizations from NATO to the Pentagon, the, the UK's Ministry of Defense, other organizations too have long studied climate change and have considered how security uh, can affect their own military and security strategies. The puzzle perhaps remains that securitization as yet has been incomplete and largely unsuccessful. We've not seen any shift towards a much more securitized kind of response strategy. We talk about climate security without actually changing the way we go about this is a topic that Rita, of course, has written eloquently about it. So I'm not going to touch too much on it because I have a feeling Rita may come back to why that isn't the case and might not be the case. But I'd like to perhaps uh, put in a different argument before Rita takes it apart, which is to say, could the crisis we're facing at the moment in the Ukraine and beyond, could that be the moment that triggers a different kind of response to climate change? Could it be that that is indeed the catalyst that we needed to drive us into a different scenario around energy usage and climate mitigation? So in my third point of the lecture, I want to come to the question of what has the Ukraine crisis done to our energy strategy and climate strategy? And I think I don't need to say too much about the conflict. We're all glued to our television sets to observe what's happening in the country and beyond. I think it's, it's obvious that the war itself has been very much driven by the two dimensions of the military dimension, uh, the use of military force, but also energy as a key tool in the conflict. Russia itself is weaponizing energy in, in the conflict, but the West is also responding in kind by trying to reduce its energy dependence on Russia. So the first point to note is, of course, that the war has created havoc to our Western energy strategy, and with that, I think, uh, has also affected uh, directly our climate strategy. But how has it done so? That's the question I want to explore with you. The first point to note is the war has certainly exposed a huge energy strategy blunder that the West and particularly Europe has 
uh, committed. I, I should exclude the United States here because it was, of course, the United States that has long argued against what Europe did in terms of inviting energy dependence on Russia. Um, if you look at this graph, this shows you the levels of uh, uh, natural gas production uh, and imports uh, by, by different countries to Europe. And as you can see, back in 2015, imports from Russia were at a level of around 36 percent. They actually rose by 2018 to 41 percent, only to fall back in the year before the invasion to 38 percent. Now, that may seem like a stable picture, but the interesting point to note is that we had two warning calls when Europe should have woken up and realized that this is not a recipe for energy security. The first warning call came, of course, in the various crises between Russia and Ukraine over deliveries of, of natural gas shipments, where it, it became apparent that we were at the mercy of, of a weaponized uh, energy system. But then the second crisis, of course, came in 2014 when Russia invaded and annexed uh, Crimea. And if you look for any evidence of what 2014 did to our energy strategy, then you'll look for a long time. It did nothing. For that reason, I think uh, Germany's Foreign Secretary, Annalena Baerbock, is right when she said in an interview in August that the notion that we uh, were dependent on cheap gas from Russia was always an illusion because, as she said, Germany had paid for it, quote, with its security and independence. And she added that the Ukrainians paid for it thousands of times with their lives. So we've committed one major strategic blunder. And the question is, what has Europe done to get out of that uh, 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 difficult position? The short-term perspective, and here I need to distinguish between the short-term and the long-term, uh, can be seen from the depiction of, of our current strategy to reduce um, Russian gas imports on the right. But let me talk about this briefly. It's clear that we are having to reduce Russian gas imports as quickly as possible. And we've done this so far, if you look at the, the, the different elements that, that you see depicted on the right, through four different means. There's first of all gas demand reduction through efficiency gains, simply re reducing demand. Public buildings in Germany are now set at 19 degrees Celsius. So um, anyone who knows LSE buildings, that's what you often get when our heating system doesn't uh, uh, quite work as predicted, but that's now the norm in Germany. And that has made a small but noticeable difference. We've then seen an increase in increased gas imports from other regions of the world, Qatar, the United States, Algeria, and so on. So there has been some fuel switching going on to reduce Russian um, uh, imports. We then have seen also an increase in other fuel use, particularly coal, which is, of course, still abundant in certain parts of Europe, Poland, Germany, and so on. And then an increase in LNG shipments from further afield. So what we've seen is a, a, a classic securitized response. The need to act quickly has led to a panoply of different responses that all make sense from the perspective of gaining energy independence. Um, that's had some impact. But, of course, it had the disastrous impact on climate change. Emissions in the first half of this year have so far risen by 2% in Europe after many, many years of declining emissions. And what we've seen is a lock-in of new infrastructure as, for example, Germany builds LNG terminals to import more gas in the future as the lifeline of coal-fired power plants is extended. So in the short run, there's a clear conflict between energy independence and climate security. And we have concluded so far that this is a necessary trade-off trade -off that we have to live through. Um, the bans that are currently in place, uh, coal is already uh, eliminated, eliminated from Russia. Uh, the ban was relatively easy to implement because coal is abundant, of course, and there are global markets. The oil embargo is meant to start this winter. Again, we can supply and get oil from many parts of the world. So again, that is not the key urgent issue. The main problem is, of course, around um, uh, gas.
Has the strategy worked? Let me focus on Germany's example, partly because the data on that are, are quite, quite uh, interesting here. On the left, you can see the monthly Russian gas imports from Russia to Germany from January 21 till uh, May 22, so right into the conflict. As you can see, in the first few months of the conflict, very little actually changed, not least because gas cannot be easily replaced. You can't build pipelines quickly. You can't redirect tankers of LNG very quickly. There's only one year when gas flows uh, fell below the uh, national, the, the, the long-term average, and that's in July 21. That's the month when Gazprom used to carry out its repairs on the, on the gas pipelines and, and occasionally shut down the plants. Now look on the right-hand side. This starts in March 22, the graph, and then takes you all the way down to August this year. And here you can see what happened uh, from June onwards. Russia reduced its shipments, but also this was the beginning of the period when Europe began to draw down other reserves that it had built up and, and drawn other imports from other countries. And then in July, Gazprom completely shut off gas supplies, uh, clearly threatening future, um, future shutdown of the pipeline. It resumed flows briefly after July, and they're now at such a minimal level that it's clear that uh, Europe will not get any gas uh, for, for the rest of the winter. So Germany has, has both experienced a kind of uh, a Russian response, but has also driven that change in itself in the hope of weaning itself off uh, uh, Russian gas uh, reserves. Has it succeeded so far? Well, it's early days. The good news is the measures taken so far have led to a situation where, in Germany at least, uh, gas reserves are well above the legally mandated level. The blue line is the actual reserve level of gas reserves. The orange dots are the legally mandated targets that were set this year for where the reserves should be. Uh, the same can be said for European-wide gas levels. They vary from country to country, but um, they are broadly above the level that they used to be in the last five years on average. So the measures taken so far have given us enough breathing room to wean ourselves off Russian uh, uh, energy dependence for now. So it's proof possible to create a securitized energy response in the short run. But of course, the impact on climate change has been, uh, as I mentioned before, devastating. Is there hope in this? Because in the long run, this may look different. And I think there is indeed reason to think that if this response can be kept up, then we're in a position where we can accelerate not just gas replacement, but gas elimination. And this is most difficult for gas. Gas is a transitional energy source that we will need in the green energy transition in the sense that it, it allows us to switch off coal and, and oil-fired power generation more easily. But I think the measures are in place and, and can be seen on this. On the right, you can see a map that shows you which countries uh, have laid on which kind of energy sources uh, and where uh, uh, certain energy sources were dominant in, in new energy creation. So you can see here, for many countries, solar energy is the dominant new energy source uh, brought online. That's the case particularly for European countries, but also for the United States, Mexico, Brazil, China, India, and Australia. Some countries have primarily laid on wind and hydro energy. That's Canada, the Nordic countries, Britain too, but also Argentina and some African countries. But there are very few countries left for whom coal or oil or indeed gas is now the main new source of energy that is being invested. So the shift has been accelerating for some time away from high carbon to low carbon energy and from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And the changes that have happened in Europe, the regulatory changes that have happened, are encouraging in the sense that they bring about a much faster conversion. Let me just give you some examples. Within several months, the European Union was able to increase its renewable energy target. 
Uh, it used to be at 40% by 2030. The target is now at 45%. Germany moved the target up to 80% and brought its coal phase out forward by eight years. Uh, that is not that, that is a target that is, hasn't been implemented yet, but is on the agenda and the, and the measures are being taken. Uh, we've seen a dramatic increase in investment in renewables. The European Commission has uh, detailed plans on how to drive up solar and wind energy installation. And of course, we're now realizing, largely due to the failings of European energy policy, that this also needs to be complemented with an integrated energy system around Europe. Right? So in order to make this work, we need better transmission of electricity in order to deal with the unevenness of renewable energy supply. That's already happening. It's not happening on a scale where we need it, but that's the next step in that energy transition. It's even happening between Britain and France. Who would have thought? Um, apparently, I've learned recently, uh, France sends electricity to us and we do the same, sending it back to France not least because we have different electricity peaks in both countries. So the French have their peak in the morning between 8 and 11. That's when they switch on their manufacturing plants and Britain supplies energy to France during that period. The British peak is in the afternoon from 4 to 8 when Brits switch on their kettles and switch on their television for East Enders and, and France is helping with electricity for that. So that is already on the cards even outside an integrated EU energy market. But those steps need to be stepped up and, uh, and the mood music we've heard so far coming out of Brussels is fairly encouraging. That means this could just be the moment where Europe uses, and I use this carefully this word, uses the Ukraine crisis for a broader and, and better climate purpose. This could be the moment where we are beginning to see a kind of securitized response to the climate crisis that comes out of a securitized energy response. If we get the parameters of that transition right, so far all political leaders around Europe have pledged that the extended use of coal-fired plants is of temporary nature. Right? The current measures will set us back, back in the net zero transition by a year or two, but we can make up that ground if we use that momentum to accelerate the green energy transition. And this is where high politics, geopolitics, and low politics come together. Right? This is where insulating your homes, uh, reducing energy consumption, improving energy efficiency, dull, boring, low politics becomes of critical importance. As a, a study by Carbon Brief, one of the, the fine think tanks in the UK that looks at carbon data has shown, had Britain not got rid of what uh, David Cameron once famously called the green crap, that is the home insulation program that was up and running until his government reduced the funding, we could have reduced gas imports in the UK by now by 13%. That would have eliminated all Russian gas imports already and much more. So there is an argument to be made, therefore, that we need to merge those low politics, those boring politics of the climate mitigation strategy with the high politics of our energy independence that we seek. Okay, I think I need to come to the conclusion. So, where does this leave us? I think it's clear that there is a strategic dimension, therefore, to energy and climate policy. And for me, this means, first of all, that the net zero transition should not be seen in isolation, but needs to be made an integral part of our energy security strategy. To play one off against the other is, is not very far-sighted, and we need to recognize that despite short-term priorities that may get in the way, the two work together, go in the same direction. This produces very tangible results on a geopolitical platform too, because we need to reduce our dependence on fossil fuel exporters. Petro-states like Russia that abuse their uh, power in global energy markets need to be countered on many levels, but particularly on the energy front, and that ought to be both an energy and a climate uh, priority. But beyond that, as I outlined before, we need to also integrate the sort of strategic thinking around tipping points into general uh, forward planning for climate policy. 
we are still stuck in too much of a linear mode. We need to prepare for those tipping points as and when they hit us. And that calls, therefore, at a national level, at a European level, at an international level, perhaps for new bodies, new committees of strategic foresight for ex extreme climate risks. We need to prepare for the acceleration of those risks that I've outlined before, and that is an urgent strategic task. This is not going to be easy. And so, looking now at the audience that comes from a more climate perspective, we also need to look at the strategic challenges that we face in the net zero transition. First of all, the rush into green energy means there will be ever more competition for strategic minerals, and that will need careful planning. We are not there yet. We haven't got a global governance system for dealing with any potential shortages of those strategic resources. Will we uh, end up in international conflict over those resources? That is to be avoided. We will have to deal with the stranded assets problem. There will be countries that will face, will face economic decline as a consequence of the net zero transition. Some of them quite far-sighted. Think of the UAE, the Gulf states, they're preparing for that transition. Saudi Arabia, somewhat behind. Russia, clearly not interested in that agenda. We need to think about the security complex that this creates. We, um, and we need to think about the financial stability that, that is at risk. Who will be allowed to engage in geoengineering? Which great powers will have the means and the will to conduct geoengineering to slow down global warming? Will there be a global solution to this? Or will it be left to some major powers, the United States, China, that will do this on their own? There's a real risk that unilateralism will prevail. And that, again, creates huge risks for the world. Climate adaptation. A lot of countries will need to adapt. We've already baked in 1.3, 1.4 degrees of warming. And more is to come. There will be countries that need help with climate adaptation. Will we help them, or will a resurgent nationalism rule the world where every country will look after its own? Uh, food security is going to rise on the agenda. It's already, uh, we, saw, we saw this from the Ukraine war, but will lead to greater instability. And finally, migration, as mentioned before, may yet end up on, on a high-level agenda. So, so I think there's good reason to argue that the merging of these agendas of strategic thinking and climate mitigation is urgently needed, and both sides can learn from that. May I conclude, though, with a message to the students in the room who's doing strategic studies? Can I see a show of hands at the end? Ah, I was hoping for more. <laughs> Here's my last thought before, you, um, before we carry on. You'll be familiar with the sort of standard reading that you get when you do strategic studies. These are the greats of strategic thinking. They are, <laughs> they are, of course, on your reading list. In the wrong order, they should be. Two of them alive, two uh, uh, have already passed away. Um, <laughs> the order in which I don't know how, how your syllabus is structured, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll have to tell me later. I would suggest do carry on reading them. And how, how could I possibly suggest that we need to replace any of these great but perhaps we need to expand the strategic reading. We need to throw some more text on the reading list. There's Rachel Carson. Her book, uh, Silent Spring, was published 60 years ago. We are celebrating the anniversary this year. Barbara Ward's book about that paved the way for the 1972 uh, Stockholm summit is 50 years old. Mandana Shiba, who put global justice at the heart of the climate debate, is still alive and still working in that area. And Naomi Oreskes at Harvard University has done excellent work to unmask climate skeptics and their corporate lobbies. So here's a suggestion for a, an updated security studies reading list. And Christopher, I'll drop some books off at LSE Ideas if, if they're not there yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So here we are going straight uh, to another person talking.
Um, it's actually quite late for me. You know, normally I give my lectures, I think, in the morning, but hopefully I can talk some sense. Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, as Robert already said, I do do quite a lot of work on securitization, um, and therefore one of the themes I'll be talking about is the effect of the war in Ukraine on the securitization of climate change. And then the second aspect I want to talk about is the effect of the war on climate security. So um, security in, in two different um, understandings, once as a social and political practice, as in securitization, and once actually as a condition of being secure. So they're quite different because obviously you may be able to achieve climate security through securitization, but securitization may actually also have the opposite effect. Um, so those are a couple of the themes I will briefly mention. Um, perhaps should have had a PowerPoint. I haven't got one. I didn't sort of realize what the format would be. Um, so I'm sort of going to be reading, more or less reading this off so I don't lose the plot. Um, so let's talk about um, the effect of the war in Ukraine on the securitization of climate change. Um, and the securitization of climate change really means uh, raising uh, the issue of climate change to the top of the political agenda where it would then be addressed using extraordinary means. Um, and in, in Robert's book, um, which of course I read in preparation for this, Environmentalism in Global International Society, it's called, um, he shows that thus far in the world, really, um, the securitization of climate change is at the rhetorical level, which is also what he said a couple of times to the presentation. Um, and I think a way to, to, to capture this quite vividly is if you think about the European Union and also quite a lot of states in 2019, certainly before COVID, um, all were busy declaring a climate emergency. I don't know if any one of you remember this, you know, that we are now living or going through a climate emergency. But uh, in all of those cases, I would say, no extraordinary extraordinary measures um, followed that declaration of the threat. Um, even though, of course, um, I, I would say that in large parts of um, Europe, certainly, that um, climate threat is pretty much accepted, which would mean you know, that what in securitization theory is called the audience, which we can take to be the electorate, um, actually accepts that. You know, most people think, yes, climate change actually is a threat. So if there is the declaration and the acceptance, it would, according to the theory, allow that extraordinary measures are adopted. But that hasn't happened. So then we can look at the reason why not. Um, I, I haven't really got time to go into the why not, but certainly one of the things um, that did come up in the talk and also I think in the book is this issue of well, what would that actually look like? You know, I think we have some difficulty imagining what extraordinary measures would look like that we, we haven't seen before. Um, but I think it could be something like banning polluting industries, restrictions on a flying for pleasure or for business, um, restrictions on the use of personal transport, um, it's kind of the sort of restrictions we saw under COVID as well. Obviously, with a different purpose, but the, you know, work from home because um, we need to cut down on carbon emissions. If everybody goes into work in their car, then that obviously raises um, carbon emissions. Um, I would say that over the past decade or so, this rhetorical securitization of climate change um, has become quite established. You know, we are used to the phrase um, climate security, for instance, or um, even the climate emergency. Whereas when I look back, when I did my PhD on uh, environmental security in 2007, I finished, um, it was very much, what are you doing? Environmental security, what's that? People had no real concept of that. 
And, um, you know, here we are not that many years later, and climate security is, um, is very well known, I would say. Um, but I would also say that climate change as a security threat comes in waves. So what I do with my students at the beginning of um, a new term, I often ask the students, what do you think is the most important security threat to your country of origin and to the UK? And the list is always quite broad, but the list is also usually informed by what's going on right now. Um, and climate change is very often replaced by the big security threat. So climate change is replaced by COVID. You know, you will hear of climate change and security threat before COVID, but not so much during COVID. And I think that's also why a lot of analysts or a lot of people who care about these issues, they then find it necessary to link the issue they care about to the big security issue, which in a way is what we're doing here tonight, right? Um, so, I would expect that climate change, um, as a security threat, the securitization of climate change, would be sidelined by the Ukraine war. And, I mean, I haven't done this in much detail, but I looked a little bit at speeches by, you know, relevant politicians, for example, von der Leyen's um, State of the Union, um, doesn't mention climate change to the same degree as it has done in the past. Here you might say there, well, that's because the point's already been made, and she did mention it in previous years, and it's been accepted and established, but I think it goes right the way through. For instance, if we recall that um, the IPCC, I think this is the, um, the sixth assessment report, the second working group, they uh, finalized um, uh, one of these reports, um, yeah, the second working group that was, on the 28th of February um, this year. Obviously, that didn't get a lot of press. It didn't get a lot, as much press as it would have done ordinarily because of the events um, in Ukraine. Similarly, um, NATO, NATO was mentioned earlier, um, NATO this year, um, uh, turned out its uh, NATO 2030 strategy and uh, climate change is a part of that but again that got I think uh, less press than it might have done in another year. Um, so it seems to me that um, security threats are always ranked in some sort of importance you know down to imminence um, the, the Russian threat I guess is in the here and now the climate change threat still feels some distance away. But perhaps it's also a little bit what we know. You know, we, war is a more tangible thing than climate change um, to most people. Um, so I think we can say that while the securitization of climate change was imperfect or really incomplete or unsuccessful before the war, um, I would say that the war has made successful securitization of climate change even less likely. And then you can ask, well, is this a problem? You know, is this a problem that we no longer have so much in the way of this kind of rhetoric? Um, and I would say, well, it's a problem only if we think that securitization will actually lead to climate security and climate security here as a state of being. Um, and in the literature, there's quite a lot of reason to believe that that is not the case. And this is because um, climate security has so many different interpretations. So it depends on who speaks climate security or performs climate security. Um, so for instance, um, the military, and again, I mentioned the military because um, Robert mentioned the military earlier. I mean, they were actually um, leaders in the field of environmental and climate security. But by climate security, they don't necessarily mean what we think of as climate security. You know, we probably think of climate security as making the climate secure for people and animals and plants that live on planet Earth, that we all sort of live in some sort of better harmony. But the military actually cares about does um, environmental degradation or climate change affect their ability to provide military security? So for instance, you know, do hurricanes damage military bases? 
does sea level rise affect um, the security of military bases? So it's a very different view of what climate security actually means. Um, and I don't want to say it's bad, it's a, it's a bad interpretation of climate security, but it's certainly not as holistic as we might want it to be. And so therefore, um, whether or not um, climate change is securitized, it's actually not necessarily um, a good thing or a, a positive contribution to achieving climate security. Okay, so let me now turn to this second argument, which is the effect of the war on climate security. And this time I do mean the, the sort of positive, not positive, the positive holistic view just described. So the view that making the climate genuinely safe. Um, so in Robert's talk, he sort of presents this view that the Ukraine war is an opportunity to achieve climate security. Um, and I would say there is a possibility of that. Um, like Robert, I'm originally from Germany. And I would say, especially in Germany, um, green values and sort of care for the environment runs perhaps slightly or is, is, is more established to a degree, I don't know if that is correct, than, than here. Certainly, um, there is a, um, you know, the, the Green Party, for instance, is doing quite well in uh, nearly all of the different uh, uh, lender. And um, so I don't, in other words, want to pour cold water on what you've been saying in terms of, you know, the possibility of uh, achieving climate security. Um, but if I agree with everything you say, I guess we don't really have much of a discussion. So let me um, let me say or put put forward a few points um, against the argument that the war will lead to a greener energy security strategy. And I've got, I think, about five points. Um, the first one is um, that actually, when you look at what's been happening uh, in terms of um, the adaptation that uh, Germany in particular, and this is very heavily German focused, um, is that, that coal is actually kept going. And that's the first one. So Germany promised to phase out coal uh, by 2030, but obviously because of this energy crisis, they had to reactivate some of the already mothballed or destined for mothballing plants and um, are keeping coal going very likely now till 2045. Um, and the same is true, I think, of nuclear, not which, uh, which quite such a long, um, uh, I don't think for such a long time, but certainly they haven't quite committed to closing all of the nuclear power plants just yet. Then the second one is, um, I don't think, and this actually almost contradicts what I said earlier about the Germans being uh, very green, uh, now I'm going to say that there's discontent among the German population towards these measures, right? Essentially, people aren't happy to pay the price for energy that they will have to pay. Um, and this is especially the case in East Germany, where apparently 65% are actually for the reopening of Nord Stream 2. Um, and I don't think that they would accept or very happily accept um, this sort of green, expensive green um, uh, energy policy. Um, then the third thing is that, of course, politicians try and capitalize on the situation. And the uh, main uh, opposite, the leader of the opposition, uh, Merz, who's from the CDU, CDU um, he, of course, um, has a different view of what uh, the uh, energy security strategy should look like and calls this sort of uh, greening of the uh, energy uh, suggested by the um, SPD and, and coal as essentially a threat to the economy. You know, it's madness, we shouldn't be doing it, it's a threat to the economy. Therefore, of course, also playing towards the fears of some of the population, and we have to remember that uh, during the last election, there was only a nine-seat difference between 
the uh, SPD and the CDU. So it's pretty tight margins. And there's a question, you know, can, um, I mean, assuming that the SPD would want to remain in government, can they actually um, continue with this line? At the moment, all of the public opinion polls have um, the CDU 10 points ahead of the SPD. Now, whether that is directly related to that, I do not know. Um, then another point uh, against Robert's argument is this uh, question of, are the green alternatives really green? Um, so one thing we should know is that the European Union, and you had some graphs in terms of what the European Union wants to achieve, um, is that they recently included gas into its green finance taxonomy, um, which is this labeling of um, natural gas as um, essentially a green energy source that could then be um, supported and subsidized. And it's essentially, a, I suppose, a form of greenwashing of this particular energy. Um, and then, of course, we can also look at the green energy tr transition in general and ask how climate friendly that actually is. And then we come to points such as um, how do they actually get these rare minerals out of the stone that will be needed for um, all of us driving around in electric cars, for example. And that is actually hugely carbon intensive. So you mentioned, you know, the conflict, the possibility of conflict, but actually um, uh, I have one statistic here. This comes from Nature Geoscience, um, is that greenhouse gas emissions associated with primary mineral and metal production was equivalent to approximately 10% of the total global energy-related greenhouse gases in 2018, right? So, but that's 2018, so we would obviously just expect that to go up, you know, as we need more of these minerals. Um, and there are actually quite a lot of other negative effects for the environment as well from, uh, from this kind of resource uh, extraction, including um, acidification of the rivers, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so, in summary, um, I don't think that the war will lead to either climate security or to the securitization of climate change. Um, instead, the war will and already has sidelined these and other security concerns until either one of three things happens. Um, the war stops and allows climate change as a security issue to resurface, which I you know, said earlier, it seems to do, um, or two, some sort of really extreme climate disaster happens, some sort of 9-11 of, of climate change, um, or three, there will be, there is, there is unilateral geoengineering on a large scale because I think that would wake um, people up in, in that way. If one of those things happens, then the successful securitization of climate change is likely. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, both of our speakers. Well, you were kind enough, Robert, to put my picture up. Uh, so I should uh, repay the compliment and uh, ask you the two questions you planted uh, that I should ask you, but I'm not going to do that because time is moving on and really the audience must have a, a chance um, to, to speak. So will you please, there's a microphone, I think, going around. Is there or not? No, there are micro, is there a microphone? Yes. Is there uh, yes, anyone on the other side? Microphones. Yeah. Yeah. If uh, you could uh, just say who you are, by the way, very briefly, um, and then ask your question. And I'll ask both speakers to address it if they wish to do that. OK, so I have one here. You have to press, have to press the button, but not in a Putin sense of the word. <laughs> I'll just use your voice, I think. 
A bit of geoengineering here would not go in there. Just plain engineering. Okay, good. Um, hi, I'm Matthew Johnson, um, recent graduate from LSE, and uh, I'm an analyst with London Politica. Um, you were mentioning before, and in the context of uh, Ukraine war, um, the weaponization of energy. And I think that that's something that should be considered uh, for the future for the green transition. Um, you know, case by example being uh, Rosatom, uh, Russia's nuclear energy powerhouse. Uh, that's something that is slowly making its way into many countries across the globe. Um, it's also another way that Russia could also do the exact same thing in the future. Um, and in the context of, say, China manufacturing solar panels, that's also something that could be weaponized. Is that something that uh, we should be, or could actually prepare for in our strategies for policymakers and so forth in the future, um, so we don't see uh, a repetition uh, or a repeat of history uh, down the line uh, once we hopefully achieve uh, our green transition? Thank you. Let's take another question. You can decide which ones you want to answer. Yes, back. Yeah, I'm sorry to add to the German focus of this uh, talk, but I'm also German and Felix, LSE student, um, LSE student. Um, and I, one detail that I thought of kind of missed here is that um, with the current cost of living crisis that has been sparked by the increased energy um, prices in Germany especially, uh, Olaf Scholz has announced that they're not going to increase the carbon price that was expected to rise by five cents for next year. They have cut that, so it's not going to rise. And um, I would kind of love to hear your thoughts about um, how climate change also causes like multiple crises that lay on top of each other and how um, maybe even these like situations, which I agree with you that um, the Ukraine war basically is accelerating the switch to green energies, like how also the counter side that it may, might also inhibit the green transition. Yeah, let's just take one more on the left here. Hi, thank you very much to both speakers for your insights. Um, shifting the conversation a bit away from Europe, um, uh, just wanted to address uh, your points on climate security. Um, I, I know, Robert, you mentioned that like a lot of times, you know, actually the problems to be assigned with migration can be assigned on um, state failures. How do we, you know, maybe multilaterally or like as Europe, uh, address the legacies that are left behind that causes these state failure issues and causes a lot of these countries to, you know, both suffer conflicts, uh, intrastate or interstate conflicts with climate issues, but also still be, you know, heavily producing, like, let's say, oil. So I, examples that come to my mind would be like Tajikistan or like Nigeria. So, yeah. Okay, Robert, would you like to start? Yeah, thank you for these questions, and, and I'm glad you, you pushed it a little bit out of the European dimension as well, which is very important here. Uh, I'll start with the first question, Matthew's question, about the weaponization of energy. I think that's, that's the key point that I, I was alluding to when I was arguing that this crisis offers an opportunity, because we have realized out of our blindfolds, the strategic blindfolds in Europe, when we allowed energy to be treated like a normal commodity that you can trade in the open market and you allow yourself to be become dependent on just one major supplier to the east of Europe, we've realized that that just won't do. So the current search for energy independence is partly driven by that desire to drive down opportunities for future mm -hmm. opponents to use energy dependence in that way. So it's, it's about reducing weaponization opportunities. But the interesting thing is, and that's where, where I'd like to hear what Rita has to say, this is the opening for climate arguments, because the most energy independence you can ever get is through renewable energy, right? Your wind turbine, your solar installation. Yes, you're still partly dependent on, on global supplies of certain key minerals and so on, and I, I, I think that's something we need to think about. That, but this gives you maximum energy independence and also reduces the chances of weaponizing energy supplies. That's why I think this is the, the crunch moment for Europe where we need to realize that energy independence is best served by radical climate policy. Um, so so the, 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 the threat you describe is not going to go away, but we can do a lot to address these concerns. We are already doing it with regard to China. China has in the past kindly offered to finance nuclear power plants in the UK. 
I think it's becoming apparent that that might also be a strategic miscalculation if it was allowed to go ahead. So there are many ways in which we need to look at those energy independences, interdependencies and how they give leverage to part, uh, countries that perhaps we no longer consider as friends or, or partners. So I think that is an opportunity that arises. Um, shall I, shall yeah. I take one more before, and then, of course, Rita, you'll come in where, where you feel. Um, so so the, the point about climate producing multiple crises, it's, that's, a, that's a very important point, a tricky one to answer, because, of course, climate change is that kind of all-pervasive phenomenon that's playing into a lot of different other crises. It's causing environmental stress, it's causing social stress, it's causing distributional conflicts. It's aggravating a lot of the things that are already wrong in many places. It's, it's a problem that's unequally distributed around the world. Not everyone around the planet will be faced with, with uh, catastrophic climate change. In some parts of the world, at least in the next five or ten years, you might even see your livelihoods improve. So there are deep inequalities implicated in, in the way climate change is playing out. And that, as I, as I think you, you alluded to, makes the, the treatment of climate change so much more difficult because you, you get into the other conflicts that are already there and, and that are uh, clearly getting in the way of effective solutions. Um, all the more reason to accelerate the net zero transition, all the more reason to deal with the, the con uh, distributional consequences of climate change. So when we talk about climate adaptation, that's the one agenda that's still not dealt with sufficiently. We need to think about where are the people around the world that need urgent help to deal with climate consequences. That's a huge debate, and I, I don't want to get into that now, but that's, that, that reinforces what you said, that climate change, if left untreated, if left unhindered, will, will aggravate the politics that, that we're dealing with at the moment. Well, why don't you answer the third question, and then I'll accept it. Okay, so, so outside Europe, um, there are plenty of countries that have fossil fuel legacies that need to be dealt with. Uh, interesting enough, you mentioned Nigeria, which of course suffers from a certain form of resource curse, where it would be beneficial for its own economic development to wean the country off reliance on, on fossil fuels. Um, if there's one country where fossil fuel reliance has gone badly wrong, then surely that is Russia. It's a failing Petra state. 45% of Russia's federal budget is derived from the earnings from fossil fuel exports. 45% last year in 2021. That is a petrostate, uh, if, if I've ever seen one. And it's failing because it has become so dependent on that, because it's unable to wean itself off that, in, instead of emerging as it once was once called. Remember the, the days when, when Goldman Sachs described Russia as part of the BRICS? Right? Um, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't ring so good these days to put it next to China and India as an emerging economy. It has, if anything, regressed. So I think a lot of these countries would do well to wean themselves off that. There are a few good examples we can look to. Um, uh, think of the United Arab Emirates. They are still deriving huge economic gain from selling fossil fuels, but are already sh starting the shift away towards alternative energy sources, but also alternative industrial capacities. And for that reason, it's interesting to see that the UAE is going to host the next climate conference, the one after that's happening in Egypt next year. They see that as an opportunity. So I think we need to do a lot to help those countries move away for reasons not only to do with climate change, but general development as well. Rita. Um, I only have a small comment really to, to Matthew's question, which is about this weaponization issue, largely because, uh, again, I disagree with you on Good. this because <laughs> I, I think that we will go you know, headlong into these dependencies again. I think that we will develop, you know, the, as I said, the electric cars, bring that uh, technology up, everybody will drive one, these minerals become, will become scarce, they will be produced mainly in only one region or a handful of countries. I don't have my phone. If I had my phone here, I would have already Googled where is copper mainly and that kind of thing, but I can't do that. So I have to <coughs> confess that I don't know <laughs> where these minerals are. But I do, you know, I can just see this, that we will make ourselves dependent on one or two minerals or maybe, say, 
five or six that are globally scarce but abundant in a few problematic regions. And I don't think there is any foresight planning for that because we're so concerned about climate change right now that we're just going into the one direction. So what do we need to do? You, you will need to inform policymakers that this is what's going to happen. Or the other option is, ultimately, we all need to consume just a little bit less. You know, that's the other thing. Not to have exactly the same kind of lifestyle that we have now, but in a sort of green way, because perhaps that isn't possible. We'll have to be microwaving the turkey for Christmas. <laughs> An unfortunate, un unhappy prospect if you think about it. Um, there are vegetarian options. There are vegetarian yeah. options. Yes. Christopher will <laughs> send you a couple of recipes for Christmas. <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm sure Henry Kissinger would also be very happy to send you some as, as well. Um, we've only got 10 minutes. Uh, some questions on this side of the room, please. Yes, and third row from the front. That's not on. Hello. So this is Sudarshan. I'm an MPA student at the LSE. And uh, I was also studying strategic studies uh, one year back. So my question is to you, sir. Uh, when we consider strategy, uh, strategic issues, and then when we look at countries like Maldives who are facing a mortal threat from rising sea levels, so from that perspective, when we compare uh, the issues in Europe, uh, do we feel that there is a discrimination in terms of climate response mm. among countries? And if so, how does it play out at the strategic level? Mm. Second, can this uh, lag between the powers of the country be played as an opportunity to, uh, as you said, an entry point into climate policy? So these are my two questions. Thank you. And there's another one. Yes, right at the, the, the back. There are two questions, two people, one behind the other, so we we'll have to leave it at that, but you and then the person behind you, and then we'll go to the speaker. Uh, thanks. Uh, Sahil, uh, University of Cambridge. Uh, given the strategic importance that China has, both in terms of uh, its own country, but the regions where it has influence for strategic minerals required for the climate transition, do you think uh, the West and the G7's antagonistic stance towards China is uh, hugely detrimental towards uh, climate transition um, and has, uh, I guess, spillover effects onto third sector countries um, that aren't involved in this? Mm. Yes, Liz Truss has just added geoliberalism to the geos, um, <coughs> geoeconomics and geopolitics. I think that's probably involved in your question there. Yes. G good evening. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm Victor and I'm French student of LSE. Uh, I had a question about uh, degrowth because uh, more and more specialists agree on the fact that degrowth, uh, at least in well, well developed country, would be a good solution to tackle either climate issues but also resource and biodiversity uh, concerns. What do you think about it? Do you think it's avoidable, unavoidable or not? And uh, in terms of strategic issues, what would a degrowing world look like? Mm -hmm. Rita, do you want to start off? And then we'll particularly. Not particularly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> good, thank you. So I take it degrowth is not one of Liz Truss's new phrases. Um, that, that I think, IMF may force I think I've just found a member of the anti-growth coalition that she has recently um, uh, complained about. Welcome uh, to that coalition. Um, degrowth is, yeah, it's taken off in a big way. There are more and more academics writing about it, lots of campaigners using it as a way to counter the narrative that we need to grow, grow, grow as recently said as, as, as our main imp uh, imperative. It has a certain appeal as a slogan, as a concept, as a campaign, because it alludes to the fact that there are certain natural limits to the economy, right? We, 
We don't have an unlimited atmosphere. We are polluting it with CO2, and there's a limit to how much we can pump uh, pollution into the atmosphere. There's a limit to how much we can exploit global fish stocks, right? So, so there, there's an intuitive sense in which degrowth is needed. We need to stop growing consumption beyond certain points where they lead to a collapse of ecological system. That's as far as I would go along with it. But then you need to look at the, the net zero transition. And as, as, as we've just debated, and perhaps that's where Rita needs to come in on that one, while we need to degrow certain sectors, particularly the fossil fuel sector, we need to grow other sectors. Renewable energy, wind and solar power, we need to increase battery production, we need to produce other stuff and, and find other ways of heating our homes. So that's where the, the slogan degrowth becomes quite unhelpful because it, it depicts a scenario that simply says less is more on every front. It's much more about uh, a transformation of the economy where we are able to improve well-being that may inc include some material gains but uh, that also Im uh, implies a certain uh, reduction in certain other activities. And so to come back to the car story, right? there'll be lots of people who will continue to rely on the car. But the electric car, as someone recently said, is not a solution to climate change. It's a solution to maintaining the car industry alive. And so the, for many people, the solution will be not using a car, finding alternative means of transport. But to make that your sort of overwhelming strategic outlook, I think is problematic. And it leaves behind a lot of people who are uh, politically and for other reasons put off by that. Degrowth, I, I need not add that, is also hugely unpopular in parts of the world that still feel they have a lot of growth to achieve. So I, I would ask for more nuance there. Um, China, um, very important point. And I think that's where the geopolitics uh, is so important here. Um, it's become common to think about our relationship with China in kind of black and white in binary terms. Decoupling is now seen as an all-inclusive strategy that we need to pursue across the board. That's clearly not going to work, right? We are never going to completely decouple economically, nor should we decouple when it comes to climate cooperation. In fact, interesting enough, the US has carved out or has tried to carve out climate cooperation as one area where it doesn't want to pursue a kind of a antagonistic relationship with China. It was Xi Jinping who is now instrumentalized climate change as part of the geopolitical rivalry, but I think that's short-sighted and is not going to last. I have some hope that the two superpowers will carve out and continue to carve out that, that area of climate cooperation as one area where they're bound together, where common fate rather than uh, mutual suspicion rules their relationship. But of course, we also need to accept that in some areas we are still heavily dependent on China. So that relationship needs carefully, uh, a careful management. It, it, just one thing to say, China is currently the largest producer of a lot of critical minerals, but that's largely by choice, because there are a lot of other deposits available in other parts of the world, including the United States. The United States has chosen not to exploit its reserves and has allowed China to ex uh, exploit and export them which you might argue is a very clever strategy of, um, of future uh, resource independence in the hands of the Americans. But that's just a footnote to that. Rita. I haven't got very much to add. I mean, this is sort of a little bit beyond my comfort zone in some ways, you know, all the, the, the significant detail on this. But um, I mean, I guess we can ask in general how wise it is always to be so antagonistic towards China, you know, on part of um, uh, the, the Europeans as well, because in some ways, I personally feel that they have been sometimes dragged into the antagonism th through, you know, with, within NATO by the Americans in some ways. So, um, yeah, uh, it's it's a difficult one. I th may I come back to the question about the Maldives and, and the small island states. I'm sorry, I, f I forgot to to raise that. Uh, the question was what. What is the strategic outlook for small island states? Many of them are now threatened with losing not just their sovereignty, but their territorial integrity uh, as well. I think they have given us the answer because there's very little leverage they have in this game. 
they, they cannot um, well use any form of political or military strength to to extract concessions from other countries. What they've sought to do, however, is to find strength in unity and have ganged up together the AOSIS group, the, the Alliance of Small Island States, has worked very hard and very cleverly at, at putting forward a position of the climate vulnerable countries in the climate negotiations that has really set the tone but also set the pace in the negotiations for many years. Um, they're not the most influential, they're not the most powerful, but if it wasn't for that group of countries, we wouldn't have got to the level of, of commitments that we have in, in the International Climate Forum, I would argue. Uh, one shouldn't underestimate the, the, the moral power of the argument they've put forward, and that's quite uh, remarkable. But that is, of course, a very weak position that they've been dealt with. Uh, their hand is not very strong. So I think they have to rely on numbers and, and, and alliances that they've formed. Uh, the European Union plays an interesting game, often aligning with the high ambition countries such as the small island states when it suits its own uh, strategic calculus, but it doesn't always uh, see through on, on, on that front. So I think there's a lot to learn from, from climate negotiations in terms of how you can maximize your moral and political leverage. But um, unfortunately, as is so often said in strategic studies, only some states matter really to the, the balance of power and the Maldives certainly doesn't. Well, on that uh, pessimistic note, <laughs> perhaps we should come to an end. I'd like to thank both speakers. And when we started this uh, series on st strategy, we were really thinking of long-termism as opposed to short-termism because the main criticism of strategic thinking in the past 20 years has been we're all very short-term. And when I talk about strategy, I always remember what Britney Spears' manager said after she shaved her head one day rather unexpectedly was this uh, spur-of-the-moment decision or had she been thinking about it for some time? And the manager said, Britney doesn't, doesn't do strategy. <laughs> so... Uh, a book has just come out, and this would be my question to both speakers if we had had the time, called What We Owe the Future, um, which is selling a lot of copies, uh, and it is promoting a philosophy, if you can call it that, of, called long-termism, which is on the understanding that most of human history is yet to be written, given the average life expectancy of a mammalian species, uh, and that most of human beings have not yet been born, that we should think long term, but it's incredibly difficult to do so. And if you looked at the reviews of that book, by the, the critical reviews of that book, they come up with some very interesting ideas about, as Robert, you said, I mean, rationality. It's our minds and our brains are not really hardwired to think of the long term. And when we do, we always know we're going to find the unexpected along the way. And I would like to have teased you out on that. But if you're interested in the philosophy of long-termism, that book is quite, quite good to read. Um, that's enough from me. I, it just remains to thank our speakers for coming today, to thank the audience very much, to apologize to those many hands which went up, or people whose hands went up. We weren't able to invite them to ask questions. Can I ask you once again to thank the speakers? <laughs>